generations and generations of Indigenous kids went through these schools. And along with the cultural genocide that was, you know, deliberate and a goal of these schools, there was often horrific physical and sexual abuse. And so children, you know, for up until the 1940s, 1950s, it was actually, you know, law that children, Indigenous children, attend these schools and families were were forced to give their children over to the Indian agent and the RCMP and the priests who came to the door, or they could be put in jail. Hello, and welcome to Why This Is Happening with me, your host, Chris Hayes. You know, a few years ago, the political satirist and comedian, filmmaker, activist, Michael Moore, I don't know how you best characterize the many things he does. He had a a one-person show on Broadway that I went to that was very entertaining. And one of the bits he would do in the show was about the difference between Canada and the U.S. And the point of the bit was that everyone in Canada knows everything about the U.S., but no one in the U.S. knows anything about Canada. And to illustrate this, he would randomly pick two people from the audience, one person from the U.S. and one person from Canada. He would also make sure that the person from the U.S. was like, like from like Harvard or something, like from some fancy school. And the person from Canada was usually just from a random place. He didn't go to school in the U.S. I mean, a random place to Americans. Then they would go up on stage and he would have a live quiz show for each of them with details about each country, like how many provinces are there in Canada? And the Canadian would know the answer and the American wouldn't. How many states in America? The Canadian would know the answer. The American would know the answer. And it would go on and on like this, like, what's the name of the, you know, the prime minister? And what are the two major parties? And blah, blah, blah. And it's a very funny bit because he could be, he was convinced, he was sure, like the whole setup to the bit was he wasn't controlling the people in the audience. He just knew it was the case that there was this like profound asymmetry between what Canadians know about America and what Americans know about Canadians. And I bring that up because there's a story in Canada that has been playing out over the last several years that has been, I would say, at the kind of periphery of my news consumption, which is a story about the residential school system in Canada, which is an enormous story there, has been kind of front page news there, and is about the legacy of a system of forced schooling of Indigenous children in schools where these children were, A, abused quite horribly, and also underwent a process of, I think the most appropriate term is cultural genocide. I mean, it was a program that explicitly existed to drive the Indianness out of them, the indigenousness out of them, their language, their culture, their rituals, their beliefs, and to change them fully into Canadians, you know, non-indigenous people. Now, I've read about this story. Part of it, uh, there was a mass grave that was found on the grounds of one of these schools, which was the moment that sort of precipitated an enormous reckoning, the appointment of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. This has been an unfurling story in Canada. American media coverage has been, there's been some, there's some in the New York Times and other places, but it hasn't been that um, full. And it's, you know, it's one of those stories where there's a huge mismatch between like If you're a conscientious news consumer, a mismatch between like, yes, I know this thing happened and it's bad. Like, if you ask me, like, was that, you know, and the full force of what happened. And, you know, occasionally you'll encounter really great reporting that can transcend that gap. I think that's one of the things that great journalism can do. And an example of great journalism is this new podcast that I've been listening to, which is just exceptional. It's called Stolen Surviving St. Michael's. It's produced by Gimlet Media. It's available exclusively on Spotify. And its creator and host is a journalist named Connie Walker, whose own family has an intimate connection to this one particular residential school called St. Michael's. And she investigates her own personal history, her family's history with it, and unspools this story of the atrocities, if there's no other word, that were committed there. I have found this podcast incredibly moving and incredibly illuminating. I really urge you to check it out. And before I introduce Connie, I just need to note that this episode contains mentions of sexual and physical abuse. You should definitely take care while listening, or if that kind of thing could be triggering for you, maybe skip this episode. But Connie Walker, host of Stolen Surviving St. Michael's, joins me now. It's great to have you, Connie. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. This is an exceptional piece of work, and I was trying to sort of figure out the best way in. In some ways, I want to... So there's two things I want to do. I don't want to spoil anything because there's some suspense. I almost wanted to just 
because I'm in the business of like narrative and storytelling, I kind of wanted to start with your open, which is a great open. <laughs> so let's start with the way this opens, because I think that's a good way to, to hook the listeners uh, and, and certainly got me. What, what's the first moment of this podcast? The first moment really takes the listeners back to my home. I'm from rural Saskatchewan, which for Americans who don't know Canada, is basically just north of North Dakota and Montana. So Canadian prairies, very flat, very huge sky. It's beautiful. I love it so much. And we take the listeners back to one night in the late 1970s. And it's, you know, I think that there are roads that you drive on that I'm very familiar with, but it can feel like you're the only person around. And in the 1970s, my dad was driving on those roads. He was a police officer in rural Saskatchewan on patrol one night for the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. And he saw a vehicle on one of these roads that was swerving, and he pulled over the car because he thought the driver was drinking. And when he got to the driver's side window, he realized that he recognized the driver. It was a priest who had abused him when he was a boy at a residential school. And my dad, in his uniform, pulled the priest out of the car and beat him up on the side of the road that night. And then expected, um, as the story goes, to get into trouble, to get fired, to have something bad happen to him. But nothing happened. The priest never made a complaint. And my dad went on with his life, and the priest went on with his And it became a story that my father told. He told, you know, some of his brothers and sisters that it had happened. He told his wife. And he told my brother, who then posted it on Facebook uh, a year ago. And I was just scrolling through Facebook one night, and I I read that post about my dad. And, you know, it it just was shocking. That becomes the— entry point, the, the the sort of liftoff for this project, both narratively in the podcast and as a journalistic endeavor. So I want to just, let's zoom back out and just talk about the macro and, and sort of give some context again to largely, I think, American listeners who don't really know anything about residential schools. Like, what were residential schools? Where were they? How long did they exist? Sure. So, I mean, residential schools were created to kind of aid in the colonialism of Canada, right? The colonization of Canada. Um, And they were meant to kind of quell Indigenous resistance and assimilate Indigenous people into Canadian society. And so they were these schools that the government created and funded where the goal was forced assimilation. And the idea was that you take Indigenous children away from their families and communities, you know, at very young ages, like four or five, six years old, and you force them to live in these residential schools that were often run by the churches, and most of them run by the Catholic Church, where they learn English and where they're not allowed to practice their culture or speak their language, and they become assimilated. And those schools were in operation in Canada for over 100 years, and there were over 100 schools in Canada. So generally, Generations and generations of Indigenous kids went through these schools. And along with the cultural genocide that was, you know, deliberate and a goal of these schools, there was often horrific physical and sexual abuse. And so children, you know, for up until the 1940s, 1950s, it was actually, you know, law that children, Indigenous children attend these schools and families were were forced to give their children over to the Indian agent and the RCMP and the priests who came to the door, or they could be put in jail. And so my dad was one of those kids. He was actually the third generation in his family to go to the St. Michael's Indian Residential School in Duck Lake. And he went when he was six years old And he spoke his language, and when he arrived, he didn't speak English, and they were forced to to learn English and beaten if they spoke Cree, and forced to live in this school where they were subjected to terrible abuse physically, and where he was sexually abused by a priest at the school. Yeah, I mean, there's there's so much here. One thing just to emphasize for folks is that there's sort of two levels of abuse happening, which is that like even if there was no physical or sexual abuse, even if no nun or priest ever hit the kids, even if they didn't sexually molest children, as happened at St. Michael's and I other schools as well, the entire setup is a monstrosity, <laughs> like independent of that. So there's these sort of two levels happening. And and on the just the mm-hmm. policy level, like this was a compulsory law, like someone came to your door, if you were a parent, a Cree parent, and said, we're taking your kid now, 
Yeah, up until it, it was law up until I, I can't remember the exact date that it changed. But even after it changed, there was still plenty of coercion. And still we've heard from families and, and survivors who are alive now that that was their experience. One of the survivors that we talked to for the podcast says he remembers being a kid and the Indian agent and the RCMP officer and the priest coming to take him away from his parents and saying that, you know, if you don't, if you don't let let us take him, you'll go to jail. And I'm now your child's father and there are nuns at the school and there will be his mother. And that's what his parents faced. And I think, I think like knowing that it was generational as well, like my dad went when he was six years old and his dad went when he was that age. And both of his parents, actually, his mom and dad went. And both of their parents went. The same so, place, the same school. The exact same school. It was run by the Oblates of Mary Immaculate, which is a Catholic order of priests who actually ran 48 of the residential schools across Canada. And his grandfather, my great-grandfather, was one of the original students at the school in the early 1900s. So this is like, this becomes this thing that is like, you know, at first compulsory, at first mandatory for children to go to, and then becomes, you know, because of the terrible harm that came from these schools, becomes almost a form of child welfare at, at a certain point. And, and children, you know, by the 60s and 70s and 80s, that a lot of kids were there because of, of child welfare reasons as well. Like, it's it's led to these, like, incredible impacts, obviously, on individuals who were children when they lived there, but then families and then communities and the ripple effects are things that we're still grappling and dealing with today. Yeah, I mean, one of the most profound elements of the story you tell is the intergenerational trauma and how that's passed on and how stories are kept repressed for perfectly understandable reasons, but that that produces its own after effects in people and their behavior and how they, and their their sense of self. I want to just, just to, again, zoom in on this, because what this, I, I found the, the podcast so moving, but like I was just telling you before we had on, I had to take it in small doses because parts of it are so upsetting. And I was just thinking about, you know, I have a, I have a 10, 8, and 4-year-old and, you know, my little four-year-old, uh, when she started school, she was after the pandemic, so she hadn't been socialized, right? So we would take her to preschool every day, and she would cry at the beginning. And it took a few days, uh, mm-hmm. well, longer than I would like, a few weeks every day. It was the worst part of my day. And it would sort of just kill my heart all day. Like, I would drop her off, and I'd had to do that thing you do as a parent, where, like, you're just like, all right, I love you, bye, because the longer you stay, the worse it's going to be. And as I was listening to this, I was like, these kids were two years older than that. Like, these are tiny little children. And they're being taken from their family and their parents are being dropped in a place that they don't speak the language and they're beaten if they do. I mean, it's just like, it's real nightmare stuff. Like, real, like, darkest, darkest possible nightmare stuff. It's horrifying. It's really horrifying. And I think that, like, for me, it maybe sounds surprising to hear that, like, I didn't I didn't know about my dad's story. I didn't know about his experience. I knew that he had gone to a residential school, but I didn't know where he went or for how long or how old he was. And I didn't know that he experienced abuse there. But when I learned that about him, it helped make sense of so much of what I went through as a kid with him. And this journey of like, basically, you know, the the first episode of the podcast kind of lays out our goals, which is like to try to, you know, understand the truth of what that was like for my dad and other survivors who were at the school, like to be those little children and to be taken to this big red brick building that like looms over this tiny town in rural Saskatchewan. It's the biggest building around for miles and miles and miles. And what it was like for them in those schools and trying to get a sense of what it was like for them in the schools, but then also trying to identify and find the priest who abused him and the priest he pulled over as a way to to also understand, like, what kind of justice has there been? What kind of accountability has there been for survivors? And it's been this really eye-opening experience, even though I'm a journalist. I've been a journalist for 20 years. I've reported on residential schools, but I didn't know anything about my dad's experience. And so because my dad passed away in 2013, you know, I've been interviewing his relatives. He was one of 15 kids in his family to go to that school. And most of them went when they were six years old and they all spoke Cree. And talking to my aunts and uncles and sitting across from them and hearing through 
their voices, the way they're kind of reconstructing the school and reconstructing their experiences. And imagining my dad as that six-year-old boy has just been so incredibly difficult because I had just never connected those dots before. And I have to say, like, there's very few people, I think, that could tell this story. Like, I just think it's a really important story to tell, like a profoundly important story to tell. But, like, even the best, most humane, empathetic, and well-intentioned reporter, you couldn't just send to go report this. And I want to play a little clip just because, and I think you do such an incredible job, I think, obviously, because you have, like, skin in the game here. I want to just play this clip of someone that you spoke to, this is a St. Michael survivor, Eugene Arcan. And he's just like, he's telling you basically like, he's like, take care with this. Like this is, this is the most dangerous, powerful thing that you can talk about for us. This is what he had to say. When I started on this journey, that same person who helped me, encouraged me to regain my language. I told him, I'm gonna start working with residential school survivors. And he said, good, Maga. He said, Moyo Maga Meto Agata, man. He said, don't play with this. He said to me, there are still people walking around out there not being able to go home. And so I'm very cautious on how I deal with this. The stuff that I've shared with you, that's our knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's ours. It's what we've learned. Mm -hmm. And we use that in a respectful way. This is what I call Nehiamam Tenechida. This is what we have learned. We don't profit here from it. You know, we take care of it, but we have to pass it down. We use this in a good way. Don't play with this, you know? And I see people playing with it. That has stuck with me. Uh, I just, as a almost indelible universal imprecation to journalists, <laughs> the work mm-hmm. we do. But tell me about how that guided you and how you navigated this. Well, honestly, like that, that almost put an end to the podcast, really. Like after leaving that conversation with Eugene, you know, I really questioned whether I should be doing this, whether this was, this was my story to tell, you know, and, and if this is something that I should be taking on. And, you know, cause I think that the part of the context to Eugene's warning is that like, you know, for survivors, from their perspective, you know, they grew up in these institutions where they, and Eugene does this incredible job of like really kind of just crystallizing in a single conversation, just what it was like for them to be children and to have danger and predators around you and needing to like, basically like you you enter this school as a defenseless child, but immediately you need to then like find some kind of edge, find some way to survive. And he kind of, you know, it really just kind of blew me away, like how he was able to help me understand what he and my dad went through in that school. But when they left, you know, they left these schools, they left these institutions. He talks about it like he was leaving prison, like he was like imprisoned for his childhood and then let out and let out you know, into a world where you were essentially gaslit. Your experiences were not taken seriously. Nobody believed you or understood you and where you didn't have the skills you needed to be not just a parent or, you know, a, a family member, a brother, a sister, but just, you know, he he talks about, you know, how they were rank men and women, he says, who, who just had, didn't know how to love, didn't know affection, didn't know any of these things. And so what's happened, like, only recently, like, that we're starting to actually gain some awareness about what these survivors went through. And I think for me as a journalist, it's like, it's also like reckoning and understanding that we have failed, like, that it's 2022. Right. And we're just now learning the truth about this. Like, survivors have lived their whole lives and have never shared their stories. That's a huge experience. And again, I want I don't want to spoil, like I'm trying to do this in a way that people are going to want to listen to this conversation and listen to the podcast because I don't want to preempt it. Because like, I'm the kind of person that's like, I'll listen to like a Terry Grossman and be like, I don't need the book. Like, I got it. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> I think that 40 minutes. <laughs> so like, I don't want people to substitute here. <laughs> so I'm trying to sort of be careful about sort of cannibalizing some of it. But it's like, that was something that, that haunted me throughout was as I'm listening to this, I'm thinking like, you know, I'm in the 99th percentile of people that consume the news, right? I do it for a living. And like, 
this is all pretty new to me. And the level of horror that we're describing here, and when you say it was like prison, I mean, it's prison. Like, there's a there's someone that you talk to in that very powerful episode four, which is sort of montage of voices of survivors, who tells the story of, I think it's their first day or in the first few days where they just run away. And they're chased by dogs. Like, it's a child who's being treated like a convict, like a prison break. And that person realizing when that happens, like, oh, I can't, I can't leave. I'm here, I'm here against my will. It was a prison for them. Yeah, no, it, it was. And the fact that it's like it's taken this long for there to be this understanding and recognition, I think like what Eugene was saying is like that you should feel the weight and the responsibility of that. And that for, you know, the one thing that he says is like there's still people walking around out there who haven't been able to make it home. And I think he's talking about you know, the children who died in those schools because there were so many children who died in residential schools. Like, these were open for 100 years, like in the early 1900s at St. Michael's. There was an inspector who wrote a report that said that half of the kids who who were at the school were dying because of tuberculosis, because of disease, because they had inadequate shelter and food and, and all of these things. So, Like, there are kids who died there. But I also think he was talking about the people who left the schools, but then who were so impacted by the abuse and trauma that they had lived through in those schools that they were never able to go home. They were never able to return to their families, to to their communities, never able to heal from that trauma and find peace. And that when you're taking on telling a story like this, like, it it is the most sensitive and grave in— just to feel the weight of that. And it really, you know, it really threw me for a loop having that conversation and it made me question, you know, if I should if I should continue. Well, because your positionality is really interesting in this and it's part of what I think drives this and part of what I think facilitates you doing such a, a remarkable piece of work here. Like, tell us a little bit about yourself because, I mean, this comes out in, in the podcast, but like, you're a little bit one foot in, one foot out, right? Like of these worlds. And that is itself complex in you returning to this world. So tell us, how, how do you grow up? Yeah, well, I grew up on a reserve in Saskatchewan. So both my parents are, are Indigenous. But my dad went to a residential school and my mom didn't go to a residential school. Right. And when I was a kid, you know, my parents were together and my dad, like so many other survivors, really, I think, struggled a lot in the years after he left residential school. And he drank a lot when I was a kid and he was very abusive. And I grew up witnessing that and watching that and and being traumatized by that. And it really affected, obviously, my life, but it, it affected my relationship with my dad. So when my parents split up when I was seven years old, I didn't see him for probably another seven years after that, like until I I went back to visit. And I was actually going back to visit his brother, who was my godparent, who I had a closer relationship with. And I think that because I had those negative experiences with my dad when I was a kid, you know, I really kind of kept him at a distance for most of my life. And and I didn't take the time or I, I hadn't I didn't feel like I had a desire to learn more about his his life, even though I I felt like I was watching it from afar and seeing how it had changed. Like when I went back when I was 14, he had gotten sober and he had a a new family and a new wife and he was reconnecting with his culture and, and spirituality, like everything that they tried to take from him in residential school. And he became like a really, you know, a leader in the community. And, and I could see all that happening, but I also felt like, you know, my experiences with him as a kid really kind of made me want to stay back and 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 yeah and i think then you know when i heard the story then about the fact that he was abused by a priest at the residential school it it just kind of crystallized like my experiences as a kid i'm like you know it made sense like why he was so angry and it allowed me to have empathy for him in a way that was really difficult before because I remember a really angry, violent man who I was really almost relieved when my parents split up and I didn't have to see him anymore. And having that ability to have empathy for him and the situation that he was in thinking about him as a little boy going into that school and being defenseless in the way that I was defenseless when I was a kid and and witnessing Mm. that, you know, it, it really helped me connect the dots. And I feel like, you know, so much of my work and my journalism, that's my goal. I'm trying to connect the dots for people. I'm trying to, like, help Indigenous people and, and our voices and our stories be amplified in mainstream media where 
we've been largely ignored, you know? Like, it's really only been in recent years that there's been any attention on Indigenous issues. We'll be right back after we take this quick break. I have to say that you do an amazing job. Like, your father's story comes through with all its sort of profound pathos, but there is a really beautiful redemptive arc. And I know how it's very clear how hard your early memories are with him and and how difficult and scary a presence he was then. But also that he, I mean, in this really remarkable way, like, kind of heals himself (laughs) from like an almost incomprehensible level of trauma and kind of has a fresh start with another family. And he is, by all accounts, I mean, your brother who features in it is a really like lovely, attentive, and patient father and, and present yeah. person. And and part of the theme here is just about trauma. I mean, yeah. you know, and I, I thought about accounts and people that I've known. I've known people in my own life who were, you know, whose grandparents or great-grandparents were Holocaust survivors, you know, quite a few in my life. And, you know, it's just apparent how that's there, that's present, that hovers, that moves generation to generation. Mm. And that's really one of the themes here is just this entire community that's dealing with this trauma. I guess, talk a little bit about that because I'm, you know, I'm I'm rereading Freud right now for some project I'm working on. For fun. (laughs) Yeah, for fun, for for a book I'm writing actually. And, you know, there's a lot obviously that I'm not a Freudian by any, in any way, shape or form, but just like the central insight, right? Mm. (laughs) Which is like, you keep stuff inside. You don't talk about it. Yeah. It's going to come out somehow, and yeah. it's going to lead you towards anger, rage, substance, depression, whatever it is. The only way out is through. Yeah. you got to, like, talk about the thing and acknowledge it. And that core insight, I think, really stands to the test of time and is part of what's on what this project that you're doing is about, it seems to me. I think, it, I think that's exactly, I mean, that's exactly it. Yeah. I mean, I think that the realization, and and maybe it was also partly the way I learned, like just scrolling through my phone one night and then being yeah, kind seriously. of hit with like a ton of bricks. And I felt like, you know, I tried to ignore it for a while. I tried to like put it away and put it aside. And, you know, it was actually also, I think, really important to understand the context in which I learned it, which was, you know, just a few weeks after that discovery was made of the unmarked graves of children, you know, up to 215 kids at this residential school in Kamloops, British Columbia. And it felt like, you know, people were finally starting to pay attention to survivors who who it seemed like had been like waving their hands in the air their whole lives saying like, this is real, this happened, like we've lived this, like, you know, and finally for the first time it felt like people were stopping and saying like, oh my gosh, residential schools were real and terrible things happened there. And like, and so it was so intense, I think, intensely emotional for as even just as an intergenerational survivor to be watching that unfold and then to read that story about my dad I definitely felt like I couldn't ignore it like I needed to go through it and and I feel like this is now the fourth podcast that I have done which has been like a deep dive into a single story about an indigenous family who has either had a loved one who's missing or murdered, but is also a window into a bigger world about Indigenous issues. And I feel like those have all been explorations of trauma. And what I've been realizing is, like, I feel like so much of my career has been me trying to better understand trauma. Right. Right. Like, why am I drawn to these stories of, like, (laughs) people stole, like, Indigenous people, like, stolen and forced to, like, like, fill in some dark mystery about their past. Why have I been doing that for years? Like it's, it's Yeah, it's amazing. It, you really can avoid a lot of things. Um, I think he's right about that. At Columbia University, there's the DART Center for Trauma and Journalism, and I, I did a fellowship there a couple of years ago. And it was really like this deep dive into understanding the science of trauma and how it intersects with the work that we do and, and how to be trauma-informed in your approach. But also what the biggest takeaway from me as as somebody who's experienced trauma in my life was about how to heal from it. And like one of the ways, like one of the only proven ways to actually heal from trauma and PTSD is to tell your story, to tell it in a way where you have agency and you're empowered or to help other people tell their story can be a healing thing for them as well. 
And I feel like in some ways that's what this podcast is for me because, you know, that I'm helping to kind of, you know, tell my family story and and shine a spotlight on it and to expose it. Because I think with trauma, you, there is this tendency and this kind of deep, deep, deep desire to avoid it, to put it away, to like not think about it, to not talk about it. But it always pops up. It, it can never be hidden. And, and this is the the spotlight we're trying to shine on it. Yeah, and it also, I think, illuminates how perverse the conundrum for survivors before the last few years must have been, which is overcoming your own feelings of shame, fear, depression, repression, to be like, here's the worst thing that ever happened to me, world. Like, to come, to to get to that point. And then to say that, and it's like, what? Residentials? Like, what do you, what? <laughs> that just yeah. off into the ether and not, mattering and not, you know, until this kind of seismic mass grave discovery and the and the cultural and social political discussion that emanated off that. Not just not mattering, like not just being, people were not just indifferent, like there's still people who deny, deny residential schools and deny the harms that happened there. And survivors, like there's been this, I feel like this kind of echo chamber of like people saying, can't you just get over it? Like that was so like this idea that it happened so long ago and that it was, oh, you see the black and white images and you imagine, well, that was a hundred years ago. And can't you just get over it? Like, why are you still talking about this? Like, and there, you mentioned in in the intro, there was like, there was a truth and reconciliation commission that was, you know, tasked with trying to record the truth from survivors about their experiences. And these commissioners traveled across the country and held events and heard from thousands of survivors and tried to record the truth about their experiences. And I remember one of the commissioners being at an event with him, Justice Maurice Sinclair, or Senator Maurice Sinclair now, and he said, you know, people say, why can't you just get over it? And he said, I say, why can't you remember it? Like, do we ask Holocaust survivors to get over the Holocaust? Do we ask veterans to get over World War II? Like, what is it? Like, it's it's like really kind of confronting the racism that still exists in society yeah. that is asking Indigenous people to get over the genocide, to get over uh, residential schools, to get over ongoing colonialism and the violence that we continue to face because of it. We'll be right back after we take this quick break. I kept thinking about, as I was listening to this, this is, you know, again, I have a 10-year-old, 8-year-old, 4-year-old, so you, I spent a lot of time on, you know, reading kids' books, and Roald Dahl is a big hit, right? And, you know, it's like, you read Roald Dahl, and obviously his experience is in a different universe than a residential school, but he was a young kid who went away to a school, which I think, you know, we would call probably abusive in, like, modern parlance. I think, like, a lot of those British prep schools, very young kids were, like, really pretty psychologically brutal places. And this was not like a genocidal institution that was attempting to erase his history. It was just like a really bad. And that became like his life's work. <laughs> it was like working through, like if you yeah. read Matilda and the scene of the Trunchbull or, you know, the, yeah. like you just read, you are reading someone working through the trauma of that childhood, you know, in one tiny pocket in, in a context far less, you know, oppressively monstrous than the residential school. And so, like, I just kept coming back to that of, like, the scope of what was done to these kids and yeah. to this culture. You can't talk about it enough, right? To, no, like, get yeah. through and out of it because it was totalizing. I guess that's my point. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it was totalizing. It was a total attempt to destroy the childhoods and the parent-child relationship of an entire people. And generations, like generations of families, right? Like, so my dad and his parents and his grandparents. The way I've been trying to learn about my dad's experience has been to interview his brothers and sisters who were also at the school. And one of my aunties, I didn't get to talk to her while I was home. And then we were, I came back and and she wanted to, to talk to me. We wanted to tell me about her experience at St. Michael's, but she was like, I'll just wait till we're home and I can do it then the next time you come down. And I said, okay. But then the former prime minister of Canada, Jean Chrétien, who was minister of Indian affairs when a lot of these residential schools were still open, he went on a talk show and he talked about his experience at a boarding school, but in a way that was like, minimizing residential schools where he was like, you know, I went to a boarding school. It wasn't great, but, you know, we just, we did it. And, you know, they didn't like the food and like, it was kind of hard, but like, 
equating his experience in a boarding yeah. school with what she had gone through in a residential school. And she saw that on the news and she was so upset. And she called me and she said, mm. this happened. Like the fact that she is an elder now, she has lived her whole life living and trying to like get through the trauma that she experienced. And then is now still facing the denials from people like that, from people who's a former prime minister who was a minister of Indian affairs. It's great that people are learning the truth. It's great that like, you know, I mean, it's actually shameful that it's 2022 and I'm yeah. just learning about yes. my dad's experience in this residential school. And we're just uncovering the truth about what happened there. But that doesn't mean that there is not still like a lot of people out there who want to deny it and who want to minimize the experiences of survivors. And that's something that they're still having to contend with. And you talk, I mean, the sort of lingering effects for our survivors. I want to play this, just this other clip from a survivor named Vincent Daniels, who was also a survivor of sexual abuse at St. Michael's, talking about the legacy of that with this one sort of very, very sort of potent example. Take a listen. They used to make us go to bed really early uh, in the evening when the sun was going down. That's one of the things I always remember, the sun was just going down. And after that, I hated to the sundowns when the sun was going down sunset one of the things I don't really um, to this day I, I always remember that every evening when the sun's going down that's all I can remember you still don't like the sunset no that's what always brings me back to that day those nights in the evening in the dormitory it really stuck with me. Like, you're reminded every night of what happened. Every day of your life. But, like, the sunset is is a painful reminder of the abuse you experienced. Yeah. Vincent is, like, I mean, we talked to almost 30 survivors from St. Michael's in the end. To, again, like, because there has never been, like, this kind of investigation into St. Michael's, but also into any residential school. Like, I feel like if you hear survivor stories from many different schools, like you get a sense of obviously these things were happening in every school, but to drill down and find out as much as we could about St. Michael's and what happened there and what was happening to the kids there. Um, we tried to talk to as many survivors as we could, and we talked to, to 28, and Vincent was one of them. And I just talked to him the other day because I was, you know, just wanted to see if he, if he was he hasn't listened. Uh, he wants to listen. And I wanted to let him know, like, especially episode four is, is is for survivors. I feel like it's such an education for us. And I feel a responsibility to hear the truth that they shared with us. But for survivors, you know, he's reminded on a daily basis about what he went through there. And it's just so, it's devastating. Like each individual, like, child, each individual story is just incredibly devastating. And it's almost overwhelming to then imagine, you know, being one of 15 kids who went in a community where everybody went. One of the things that makes this such an effective piece of journalism is that it, it is embedded in the particulars. So you can see, like, what we're talking about. And I've, again, I've been walking a line throughout here to not do spoilers and, and to create some narrative tension in the audience members listening now. But Let's talk a little bit about the trajectory you go on. You decide that you're going to try to report out your dad's experience, basically. Yeah. How does that go? Well, it's still going. <laughs> you know, I mean, we're, we're actually, I didn't know it was going to end up where we've ended up. And I won't give any spoilers. But I think that, like, for what I think is also important to me, just personally as well, is, like, is the investigative element in this story. Like, that's something that I, like, personally am finding a way through and a way forward is the investigation to try to find out who was the priest who abused my dad. And so, you know, interviewing my aunts and uncles, getting, you know, in my very first conversation, I heard the name of a priest who one of my dad's brothers accused also of sexual abuse at the school. And then in the next conversation, heard the name of another priest who was known to be abusive at the school. And then we find out that there were eight priests who were there when my dad was at the school. And we start doing this investigation into the priests and nuns who ran the school and the staff members. And I think that's, that is also like, I think a big, obviously so important to your survivors and so important to, 
give them the space to tell their stories and to to finally like uncover the truth about what they went through. But equally important in that is this idea about accountability and justice and how do survivors move forward and how do they heal without accountability and without justice? Like there have been very, very few abusers from residential schools who have ever been charged or convicted for the abuse that happened at the schools because there have been very few investigations into the abuse. It's not because there has there hasn't been widespread abuse. And so we wanted to like, you know, try to document as much as we could just like just how widespread this abuse was at this school. And that's that's something that I when I say that it's still happening, like we are still finding out new information today. And we actually like are inviting people to send us information as well. Like these are really difficult stories to report on because they're historical, because, you know, we hear the name of someone who's an alleged abuser, but as a journalist, you know, we have to also try to corroborate allegations. And and that's incredibly difficult when you're talking about historical crimes, especially in instances where there have not been any convictions. There haven't been a lot of uh, investigations. And so, you know, this is like a really, it's been a really difficult story to report on. But what we've been able to uncover is, I mean, I don't, I, there's not even, it's just, it's horrifying. Like, it's horrifying. You know, I, I did some reporting for my first book on survivors of Catholic priest abuse. So the, obviously, again, totally different context, and I wouldn't like say that like that happening to a kid in Boston is the same as the residential school system. But obviously, being sexually abused by an authority figure is an enormously traumatic violation in any context. And one of the things that you can see in your investigative work is this kind of notion of like the open secret. Like mm-hmm. inside the world, everyone knows. Mm-hmm. <laughs> outside the world, no one knows. Yeah, and the gap that can persist between those two worlds for decades. I mean, that was part of what that reckoning, you know, around Boston particularly was, right? Was Mm -hmm. that there was this gap that had persisted where, like, people knew (laughs) on the inside and the outside world didn't know. And it took, you know, the Globe and reporters and very brave survivors to blow up that gap. But part of what comes through from your reporting is, like, that gap's still there when we're talking about the residential schools, it's absolutely still there. And and I think that, like, that's part of what people don't understand. And what I don't understand is, like, why? Why why that persists, you know? Like, because I think you're, you're absolutely right in terms of, like, the survivors who were at that school. Like, it's the whole community, right? It's, like, everybody from, every family from that community went to this school. If you go and ask anybody, do you know Father Gauthier? Have you heard of Father Duhame? People know these priests and nuns and staff members and... And have stories to tell. And the fact that there has been a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, there has been an Indian residential school settlement where the government compensated survivors for their experiences at residential schools. And through that settlement, you know, survivors had to go to these hearings and talk about the abuse that they endured as children and name their abusers. Like, and the government hired private investigators to track down all of these abusers not to charge them criminally or to launch any kind of investigation, but to invite them to participate in these hearings, to ask them, would you, do you have a statement that you would like to make? And through this, like they have the names of like over 5,000 people who were named by survivors as being abusers or witnesses to abuse that happened at these schools. And we can't access that list. None of that has ever been made public. None of that has ever resulted in any kind of criminal investigation. None, zero. Unless a survivor on their own decided to go to talk to a police officer. But the fact that, like, survivors went to these hearings that, you know, government lawyers attended. They had their own lawyers. There was an adjudicator who was a lawyer who was deciding whether or not their claim of abuse was credible. So the government knows exactly how many people were accused of abuse at St. Michael's. They know exactly how many times individual priests were accused of abuse or nuns or staff members. And none of that is public. None of that has ever been made public. None of that is any information that we can access through those hearings. And that's part of what I think is just so, you know, as a journalist, something that that has just been 
my motivation. I'm like, I, I want to find out exactly yeah. how many priests were abusing kids at St. Michael's, how many nuns were abusing kids at St. Michael's, and what happened to them? Where did what, where did they end up? Because very few of them are still alive, but some of them are. Well, that's, I mean, that's the other thing that, again, in a very different context, I learned from my reporting in the Catholic Church in the domestic U.S. is that, like, they went to other places and guess what they did there? I mean, there's there is a reckoning aspect to this, and then there is a very immediate protection of children aspect to it that is, you know, been borne out in other contexts. You see it, right? And as a journalist, I, you know, I, 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 of course, am paying attention to the to the investigation that happened in Boston with the Catholic Church and the investigation that happened in France with the Catholic yep. Church and the investigations that are happening in other places. And knowing, like, that, you know, this is also a story in Canada where I feel like we have just scratched the surface. Like, we, we're learning more about residential schools and we're learning about the abuse that went on there. And why are we not then learning more about the abusers and, and what happened to them? Like, there are still people... Most of the people, most of the priests and nuns who were at St. Michael's when my dad was was there have died, but there are some that are still alive. And that's part of the podcast that we, you know, we want to find them. We want to talk to them. We want to ask them questions about their experiences at these schools and about these allegations of abuse. And we want to know what the Oblates of Mary Immaculate and what the Catholic Church have done to protect, you know, minors after, because these allegations of abuse, like they started coming, like, survivors started coming forward in the 1990s and filing lawsuits and suing the government and suing, uh, you know, the Oblates who, who ran the schools and the Catholic Church that ran the schools and the Anglicans who ran the schools. And we started accessing some of these documents and finding, like, you know, in one of the statements of defense that was filed by the Oblates, you know, they denied that they were in charge of the care of children at the school. What? They denied that they, you know, had any responsibility for the well-being of, of kids at the school. They deny employing the priests who ran the school. And, and they said, even if the abuse that this survivor has alleged is true, it's not our responsibility. It's the responsibility of the, the Canadian government. And then, it, and then the Canadian government statement of defense is like, we deny that we are responsible. It was the Oblates who ran this school. Oh my and, and God. that was what survivors were dealing with for, for so many <sighs> years. But I feel like all of these things, it's it's all been sitting there. It's all been like in court documents. It's all been in survivors in their in their lives, just waiting to be asked. Like the people in my family were not unique. This is this is my my story and my story with my dad, but we're not unique. This happened to yeah. every family. This was every every family's experience. And I f- feel so grateful to my family for being so generous and opening up and talking about the things that we never talked about. But also, you know, I think that this story could be told in every Indigenous community across Canada and by every survivor's family, which is horrifying. On that note, I mean, I, this podcast, you know, has a decent reach, and I don't know who will listen to it or, or to where it will travel or whose ears it might hit. If there are people that that have information to share who live this or witnessed it at St. Michael's specifically or at a residential school, is there a way they can reach out to you? Yeah, we have actually created an email address so people can get in touch with us directly if they have any information about St. Michael's Residential School or any of the the priests or nuns or staff members, because you're right, they, you know, they worked at St. Michael's, but some of them went on to work at other residential schools. Some of them went on to work in other Indigenous communities. And our email address that we've set up is stolen at Spotify.com. And so absolutely anyone who has any information. And, and it's been incredible, actually, just you know, what we've been hearing from people already who are listening to the podcast and and who have information. I, as a journalist, at the beginning, I remember of, of the investigation, me and my producer, Ellen, we were like, we need a whistleblower. Like, we need somebody who is like, has access to information and who can send us something because so much of, of what we want to what we are wanting to find out, we know is out there. We know that the government has, but we can't access it. And so we're always open and ready for any information. Connie Walker is a journalist and she's host of Stolen Surviving St. Michael's. It's produced by Gimlet Media. It's available exclusively on Spotify. And I I really cannot recommend it highly enough. It's an exceptional piece of of work. um, And I learned so much from it and I'm really appreciative for you coming on the program today. Thank you, Connie. Thank you so much, Chris. I really appreciate you having me. Just a few notes about what you heard today. So 
There's obviously a lot of really important and high stakes journalistic questions here. And I want to just be as specific as we can be here. So we should note that Father Duhame, one of the priests who Connie mentions, is deceased and that Father Gossier has been found to be credibly accused in an adjudicated process of sexual abuse of 16 children at residential schools. The Oblates of Mary Immaculate, an order of Catholic priests that ran St. Michael's, confirmed this information with the team from Stolen in response to their reporting. We heard back at Why Is This Happening from the Oblates of Mary Immaculate. Their spokesperson, poor Father Gautier, received a statement reading in part, quote, The Oblates of Mary Immaculate are deeply sorry to anyone who has been physically or sexually abused by an Oblate and apologize for the role that our order played in the residential school system. The statement goes on to say the Oblates listen to and support any victim or survivor who comes forward, including with a legal investigation in the case where allegations are criminal, any sexual abuse of minors or vulnerable persons by any member, employer or volunteer of OMI Lacombe Canada is absolutely contrary to the work and witness of the Oblates. We should also note uh, that there are some questions that have been raised about whether the Kamloops site that we mentioned includes graves of children as radar devices were used to make that discovery. But that said, the grave site is still being investigated and there's plans for excavation work to continue. And we should get a definitive answer on that very, very grisly question at some point. Once again, my great thanks to Connie Walker. And like I said, I've said it now 40 times on this podcast, but really check it out, Stolen Surviving St. Michael's. And, you know, we'd love to hear your feedback on this, whether it's something that uh, is a story that you did know about or close to in any way or a story you didn't know about and learned about because I have I really have been pretty affected by it, uh, I found. So tweet us with the hashtag WithPod, email withpod at gmail.com. Be sure to follow us on TikTok by searching for WithPod. Why is this happening? Is presented by MSNBC and NBC News, produced by Donnie Holloway, Tiffany Champion, and Brendan O'Melia, engineered by Bob Mallory, and features music by Eddie Cooper. You can see more of our work, including a link to Stolen and other things we mentioned here, by going to nbcnews.com slash why is this happening. 